Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the Jake's Take with Jacob L.A. Show podcast, the fifth anniversary season. I'm your host, Jacob L.A. Show, chief content producer and writer of jakesake.com, a pop culture entertainment news website. If you're watching us on YouTube, please give us a thumbs up and please subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you're listening to this on our audio platforms, please give us a five-star rating, download this episode, and subscribe and download more episodes. I am thrilled to welcome this incredible performer to as my guest today. As of this recording, she has over 100,000 Instagram followers. She's an Emmy, Grammy, and Tony-nominated recording artist actress. She has originated the roles of Mary Wells in the Motown musical and The Moon in the 2021 Broadway revival of Caroline or Change. She's also the conceiver, the executive producer, and star of the upcoming Broadway-bound Broadway musical, Dandridge. Please help me welcome the Ken to the podcast. Hello, hello. Happy to be here. Nikenji, it's an honor to have you here. I never have, it's rare that I have an Emmy nominated, a Grammy nominated, a Tony nominated recording artist. So thank you so much for for taking time to to talk with me today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And, you know, it's been, it's, it's been a whirlwind of a year. And yes, I'm, I'm happy that we're now in 2023 that's so crazy wow uh that's 2024 <laughs> no wow but yes thanks so much for having me jacob and 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 happy to uh to meet and greet all of your of your following that truly appreciate the arts and and the entertainment business it's great absolutely so let's get started so when did you get interested in performing and how did that passion evolve and desire to pursue a career in the entertainment industry Yes. Wow. Um, well, let's see. It, <laughs> it's interesting because my parents named me Nikenji as uh, it's an African name and it means uh, superior in mind. Right. So I have, a, I have this feeling that they were expecting that I would be like some, you know, uh, um, some doctor that like discovers a cure for cancer or something, <laughs> you know, and, and in, in essence, you know, I, I've always been apparently attracted to music and the musical sounds like from age six months old, my mother used to tell me that uh, I would try and emulate before I even started really talking, but emulating the sounds of the, the, the water that was coming down into the bathtub. And so my mom would like scream to my dad, like, Nikan, she's, she's, she's like singing. She's making some kind of noise. And then he was like, what, what, what do you mean? And then he would turn it off. And then I would just completely be like, I wouldn't make, I wouldn't make any more noise. Like it had, they had to run the water in order for me to like <laughs> try and make some type of musical sound. So they knew something was up at a very young age. I didn't really start getting seriously into singing until the age 12. Um, at age 10, I discovered I had this voice. Um, I was exposed to music at a very young age just because my parents loved to listen to Motown. And and then I was listening to a lot of classical music because they put me in ballet and piano lessons at the age of four. But when it came to actually utilizing the instrument that, you know, is is my my bread and butter it didn't really happen until um 10 and then at 12 i started taking private voice lessons at home school of the arts born and raised in new york bronx and brooklyn and uh went to LaGuardia high school performing arts and then i got my i got exposed to classical music and realized that i wanted to be a big time opera singer like Lee Teen Price and Grace Bunbury and all you know Jesse Norman all these amazing opera singers that I I just looked um looked up in awe and went to Juilliard and Manhattan School of Music to pursue opera and traveled all around the world um singing in opera houses as as well as here in New York at City City Opera and then kind of accidentally transferred into the world of Broadway by doing three Modivas that needed three opera singers that could sing in eight styles of music and made that transition really honestly by accident. And then my Broadway debut was with Sondheim and Sondheim with Barbara Cook and Vanessa Williams and 
uh, Norm Lewis and Tom Wopat. So <laughs> it was, it was uh, my, the turn, you know, I, I kind of dip into all these different genres now and musical centers that, that really make me happy. And it's, you know, people ask me like, which style do I prefer the, the most? And there really isn't one because I love the versatility of being able to seamlessly go in and out of these different genres. And, and that is what like really uh, makes, makes me the most happy to be able to like one day sing an aria from La Boheme and the next day uh, sing a new musical number from the Dorothy Dandridge musical. And then, and sing something that's Broadway. And then a couple of days ago, I just did my own show at the jazz club at the Amman hotel. So I do a lot of jazz as well. So it's just music is my passion and, and, and all the different styles is what really drives me on a daily basis. That's incredible. And I got to say, getting your Broadway start with first show out of the gate with Sondheim on Sondheim with Barbara Cook, Vanessa Williams, Norm Lewis, that is no laughing matter. <laughs> no, it isn't. And they were so wonderful to work with. And, and I, you know, I, I thank my, my every day, you know, to be able to work with Barbara Cook, like before she had passed away. I mean, such a legend and, and to be able to share the stage with her was definitely um, a, a blessing in disguise and, and, and just really like pinching myself on a daily basis. Like, being at that roundabout theater and working with James Lapine and, and Stephen Sondheim himself. And I even have like letters that he had typed that he left that backstage for me. And, and, you know, just having, having these really milestone relationships really helped my journey as I continue to develop as an artist. Absolutely. I really hope that you kept, I bet you have kept and make sure that you kept all of Mr. Sondheim's type letters. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. <laughs> I do. I do. That's wonderful. So I want to talk to you about because your uh, education background, because you mentioned both of them, because you have to attend Juilliard and the Manhattan School of Music are two of the most celebrated formal arts schools in the country. So what were some of the lessons that you learned from both of these schools that helped you grow as a performer? Yes. Um, you know, the school environment was always like, so key to me because uh it was really important for i feel like i flourished more in a smaller environment so like you know both of these schools are conservatories and really really hone in and focus on the performing aspect as well as you know learning you know humanities and the music history and all that stuff um but very different than i would say like a music school like that's part of a university right you know something like a uh, University of Michigan or things, you know, it's just very, very different. And I being born and raised in New York and having New York as like your campus uh, definitely wasn't a bad thing, you know, definitely um, gained my street smarts. <laughs> but Manhattan School of Music, you know, as an undergraduate, I w was definitely many pivotal moments um, at that school because this was the first time you know, being exposed to these amazing teachers uh, that are so educated and, and many of them have had careers too in, in, the, uh, in the music business and are teaching, um, you know, got a ch and then also during the summer times I would work, it was always nonstop. During the summers I would sing at uh, the music camps like Aspen Music Festival, Tanglewood, um, sing with Israel music, uh, vocal arts. So every summer in between, like it was always nonstop. Like I would go to school during the, during the year. And then during the summers, like it wasn't a vacation. It was going to Italy to sing, um, uh, Despina and Cosi Fan Tutte in Rome, you know, for the summer. So like, and then being able to, to experience Italy for the summer, you know, that was sort of like my, my, my campus, like going away and, and exploring like a different culture, you know, while in college, but still doing something that I love to do. So it like, really, it was, you have to, <laughs> as I always say, like, do not do this unless you literally can like eat, sleep, breathe this, this, this art form, because you can't, there's no point of just doing 50%, you know, you have to do like, 
250% of it in order to, you, you get out what you put in. And at Manhattan School of Music, you know, they getting the, the, the foundation, you know, I was fortunate to have the same vocal teacher throughout Manhattan School of Music and the Juilliard School. Both conservatories share a lot of the teachers, which is wonderful, um, but both experiences are very different. And I was with Edith Burrs and she was literally like a second mom to me. And, and you, you start to attach yourself to your teachers and because you depend on them so much. And I'm, I'm really, really blessed to have started at Manhattan School of Music because I felt that that, that experience um, was very family oriented. You still had a competitiveness, but it was very, very nurturing, right? Um, and and even to this day, the president of, of Manhattan School of Music, uh, Jim Gandry, will come and see my shows at, on Broadway. And I will always try if there's any type of outreach uh, tickets that some of the Broadway theaters do to some of the schools. I'll always list my school so that some of the students from Manhattan School of Music and Julia can come and see the show, like either a discounted rate or free tickets for students. So I'm always trying my best to give back to the community, especially to schools that have given so much to me. And I loved Manhattan. It was, you know, like, you know, I had my first boyfriend experience in Manhattan School of Music and, you know, my first, uh, dealing with um, um, singing, doing competitions. Um, I My vocal teacher recommended me to Westchester Philharmonics. I had my first symphony engagement while I was studying um, as an undergrad at Manhattan School of Music. Um, they had, you know, concerto competitions and, and I did um, a musical there too. So it was, it was a lot of, of learning and experiencing while there. And then when I moved to the graduate degree at Juilliard, it was much more um, uh, professional, like getting ready for the world um, scenario. Not that Manhattan School of Music wasn't that as well, but um, when I was at, at Juilliard, I had gotten a contract with Columbia artists through their community concert series. So one really wonderful thing about Juilliard, especially as a graduate student, they allowed me, they released me for two weeks at a time where I could go out and do performances and still come back and continue with my schooling with the degree. So I, as long as, you know, all the teachers sign off on it and the dean signs off on it. And they, they were very supportive about that. So I started doing solo recital concerts around the U.S. through the community concert series um, for oh my gosh, about two years, like two years out of my graduate degree <laughs> at Juilliard. I was studying at Juilliard, but then also performing and and creating my own um, recital programs. And I would tour with a pianist and then my dad would come and meet me every now and then. Um, and I, it was funny because I did not know how to drive. I did not have a license. So uh, a lot of these tours would entail you know, it didn't make any sense to fly to each city. Like some of them were very close to, to each other, but you had to like drive three hours here or drive four hours there. So part of the requirements of my pianist, I needed to have a pianist that had a driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> so that they could drive. I, <laughs> yeah, oh, believe me, I've been living in Kansas City. I still, when I lived in New York from 20, June 2017 to May 2021, I still had my driver's license. But however, I had to save some money, so I had to save the bike to my vehicle. Yeah, so I mean, I drive a lot now, but at that time in college, I didn't know how to drive. And so, you know, you would think, you know, like the job description must, you know, like be able to like be, I needed them to be flexible with being able to play from classical music to spirituals to jazz. Like even then I was mixing the genres in my recitals, but then it was like, must have a valid driver's license, <laughs> you know? Um, and then my dad would come on some of these tours and then he would relieve my piano. She was always so happy when my dad would come because then he would drive, he would drive and she'd get to relax in the car, you know? But um, so Juilliard was definitely a wonderful, amazing school to make my transition from artist to artist student to professional artist, you know? Um, I got a chance to work with 
a Frank Cassaro before he passed away, and he was the um, director of the Juilliard Opera Center. And and when it was not popular to give supporting roles to master students because it was always focused on the Juilliard Opera Center singers, he gave me a role um, in the uh, Italian Straw Hat. And because of that role that I did with JLC, I got a review in Opera News and then got an offer to sing at City Opera as soon as I graduated from school. So it's those opportunities of, of teachers and coaches that truly like see that special light in you and, and want to give you a platform for you to perform in. And then because Juilliard and Manhattan School of Music are you know, the premier conservatories, you know, the press is always coming to their performances, agents and managers always coming to check out the new talent. And so it was really a blessing to be able to go to both of those schools and have both of those schools on my resume and, and, and have relationships and friendships that I still have to this day from those, those beginning stages of my career which is amazing to have them. And then, so speaking of career, we got to talk about your Broadway experience and yeah. because you originated Mary Wells, one of the most important members of the Motown family of the Motown musical. So how did you hear about that? And what kind of lessons did you learn from your preparedness on playing Miss Wells? Um, well, with Motown, I mean, everyone knows about Motown, right? I mean, like I grew up on Motown music because my parents loved it, you know, and you know, you have all these great hits from the 60s that are still being played even now. Um, you know, that that whole, all of those artists that came from the Motown Records era is just still thriving to this day, right? <laughs> and I... I got a chance, actually, I was singing in a Motown review show in Monte Carlo, um, of all places, and there was a gentleman that heard me sing in the audience and knew Barry Gordy. So oh, wow. I did, yeah, so he connected me to Barry Gordy because he heard me singing um, in this Motown review show that he thought was like super awesome. And he said, well, Mr. Gordy needs to hear you, like, because you're so talented. And that is how I actually got connected to Barry Gordy from just a, a mutual, a friend of his sitting in the audience and watching me perform. And then one thing led to the other. And then I found out about the auditions and Mr. Gordy, um, through that whole process, became my mentor. And, um, you know, I was able to not only be a part of the show as Mary Wells, but I also got to sit in on, you know, their, their writing sessions when they were like actually writing the script and developing it. So I really had like a whole behind the scenes um, experience of the making of Motown the Musical before it came to Broadway, which many artists don't really have that opportunity to be on the other side. So it was that experience that encouraged me and led me to start developing my own shows because of seeing how um just seeing all the different moving parts and that just it was so exciting to me and uh so i i, I felt like i needed to do more than just you know listen it's as an artist you know we have to go through all, the whole audition process every day right you know you go and you stand in front of a huge table of creatives and they have certain ideas in their head as to what they're looking for when they are casting for different roles. And you can always try and second guess yourself and try and figure out like, I wonder what they're looking for. I wonder what, you know, should I wear this? Should I sing like this? Should I talk like this? You know, and you just have to like be as I've now being in this business for so long, you just have to be as authentic as possible and put yourself into that role. And if that is what hits, that is what hits. If you don't get a role, it's mainly, sometimes it has nothing to do with your talent whatsoever. It's because you were too tall or too short, or they wanted a different sound um, for that role, or something a little brighter in the tone or something more raspy or like, you know, we beat ourselves all the time about like not getting certain jobs. But like, I always say like, it's actually a blessing in disguise because you didn't get it for a reason. And, and that 
that role was meant for someone else to get. And so there's other doors that are opening for you. So being able to be a part of the behind the scenes and seeing how people think and what they're looking for when people are coming in was fascinating to me, which is why I wanted to start creating my own shows as well. And hearing these stories about these artists that we like, we, we worship so much, you know, like the, the Martha Reeves and the Vandellas and Diana Ross and, and, and Gladys Knight and, and Smokey Robinson, and Stevie Wonder and everyone, all these artists that were still living came to see Motown the musical like multiple times. I got a chance to talk to Diana Ross multiple times and, and, and Stevie Wonder. And like, it's just these icons that all came out to see how we were going to portray them on the Broadway stage, right? It was just an out of body experience to say the least. So I'm, I am, I'm a better artist now because of that experience of originating Mary Wells and, and meeting and sadly Mary Wells, you know, was, had passed away many years before Motown the musical was created, but I got a chance to meet Aretha Franklin, who was apparently really, really great friends with Mary Wells and sent me flowers backstage with an amazing note saying how like I brought back wonderful memories to her because her and Mary were such good friends. And, you know, just to know that I made that connection to Aretha Franklin and brought back memories of her days in Detroit with Mary Wells was just enough for me to just like die in a happy place. <laughs> I got to say if the queen of, if you got no, if you not only please bear it, Mr. Gordy, and please Miss Ross and Mr. Robinson, but the Queen of Soul is another. It's like to have them see your pure from you and like, especially but especially from the Queen of Soul, that's why my job gasped because the thing is yes. like out, out of Motown, outside of Motown, she was she's probably one of the greatest vocalists of all time and probably one of all the time. greatest singers of all time. Why? And then you get this these notes of appreciation from Miss Franklin, who knew your who knew the character that you who knew Miss Wells. That must mean so much to artists. Not a lot of artists do get stuff like that. No, no, no. So I'm very I count my blessings every day for those experiences. You know, Aretha and Aretha is like queen of soul. I mean, I mean, she was a full package. I mean, Aretha was a, an amazing pianist, musician, composer singer i mean you know it's not a lot of people can can reach the the level that that aretha i mean she's she raised the bar so high <laughs> oh yeah there's not a lot of people it was very day. was very frank too like you know she was she was no bs like aretha will tell you exactly how she feels and you know got to have elephant skin <laughs> if it's not so good. Right. But absolutely, you know, because she didn't play, you know, like she just was her. She's like, this is who I am. And you know, this is what I give to the world and what she gave to the world was so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I want, I want to talk, speaking of broad of Broadway behind the scenes process, I want to talk about you about a uh, Dandridge because you're starring as the legendary Dorothy Dandridge. And you are in this Broadway bound that celebrating her life. So how did you get the idea of the show? And how have you and your team made sure that hope that the younger generations are inspired by Miss Dandridge's legacy? Yes, absolutely. Well, I had when, as I mentioned, Barry Gordy was my mentor for many years. And um, as a result, I started having managed. I was under Shelly Berger's management for a a stint of time and um, he also manages the temptations and many many years ago he also used to manage the Jackson 5 and Diana Ross because he was like the prime manager for a lot of the Motown artists because he was he was part of the Motown team and also best friends with Barry Gordy so when I had met Mr. Gordy he had introduced me to Shelly Berger and Shelly Berger and I hit it off to the point where he wanted to manage me. And it was actually Shelly Berger's idea um, about the Dorothy Dandridge. Um, we were talking about projects and, and icons that I like truly related to. And he 
I mentioned Dorothy Dandridge, you know, and at the time I never produced, you know, like a, a musical in, in that sense. And he was just like, well, what about the idea of doing a musical around Dorothy Dandridge? And like, it was his, his idea. And then of course I just like took that little idea and ran with it because <laughs> I was like, okay, see you later. Bye. <laughs> and, you know, he's like, well, no, I didn't mean for you to actually create the show. You know, I like, you know, maybe an idea that you can give to a producer to produce the show for you. Right. Well, I was just like, well, why would I give it to someone else to produce when I can produce it myself? And like literally went full steam ahead in, in, um, investigating like the, um, the concept of how I would want to present her life, um, celebrating her, um, and then, then putting together a team that I thought would be like an immaculate team to truly showcase, um, the, this, this beautiful, uh, light of a stardom that she, that she had through, not just in America, but also in Europe, um, and the UK and put together the creative team, um, led by Tamara Tooney as a director and then, um, two-time Emmy winner Trey Ellis as a book writer. And then he also is a co-lyricist with Shelton Becton, um, who composed the music and, you know, I feel like I have an all-star team. We, I produced it at Carnegie Hall a few years ago, a few summers ago for the first time ever for people just to hear the music from the show and like be intrigued by like, ooh, what's next? You know, just to give them a little snippet of like, here's a concert version of some of our greatest hits from the musical. And then that went off really, really successfully. And then we did a presentation on it fully on its feet at the New York Theater Festival here in New York City um, in December and not only did we win not only did we receive the most nominations of all the musicals and plays in this past season but we also got the most wins um, as a musical so we I'm very very proud of our team we had a 12 cast member of amazing singer and dancers um, from Broadway and beyond. And now we are working on bringing it to Broadway by doing a regional theater um, before then. And uh, we've gotten some really, really wonderful attention from new producers and investors and theaters that really want to see this show like fully on its feet, costumes, musicians and lights and cameras and all of that stuff. So it's, it's definitely a, a, um, difficult task, but also enriching at the same time, because, you know, it's, you know, if anyone tells you that it's easy to bring a show to Broadway, they're lying to you. <laughs> <laughs> they're lying. But you uh, know, this is a story that I think is so important. Um, and also a story where it's, there are people who aren't familiar with Dorothy Dandridge. And we, we have to realize that Dorothy Dandridge is American history. She is a an American artist that chose to stay here in America to break through during a time that no African American women were breaking through um, in the 50s and 60s and and the only one of the main reasons why she ended up going you know overseas to start doing movies more movies after Carmen Jones and Peggy and Bess was because at that time is it was illegal to have um a uh, interracial kissing on screen like it was because of stupid laws like that that is why she had then she started doing more movies internationally and internationally they loved and adored her you know and carmen jones just just that movie alone just catapulted her her star so high and so shiny that you know she was a household name and was the first African-American woman to be nominated for an Oscar in an outstanding leading actress category. Like she started that. And then Holly Berry was the first woman to win it. You know, it's like, it took almost 50 more years for a woman to actually win the award, you know, and Dorothy's name was the first name that came out of Holly's mouth when she accepted that Oscar in like tears and emotion, you know? So she is so important to not just us as black women, but just, women in general or anyone who is 
is fighting the fight to to be recognized, to be noticed, to to have their talent show without um, you know over how they look or the color of their skin or or the race or or who they love. <laughs> you know, it's just. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it's so, it, her story is so important. And so every day I, it's, it's my, it's my passion to make sure that people truly appreciate um, Dorothy's star. And I think you're, and Kenji, I think you're going to do a fabulous job because the first time I heard about Dorothy Dandridge was Halle Berry's, Halle Berry's film. Yes, yes, yes. Introducing Dorothy, you know, so it's. You know, we just got to keep pushing and keep pushing so that we all these unsung heroes are are celebrated, you know, in, in their fullness. Absolutely. Absolutely. I cannot we cannot start end or like continue this conversation without talking about Goosebump moment. It's I love that song. And it was a wonder. Yeah, it was wonderful. I loved hearing your your upper register. I loved hearing that. Oh. I'm sorry, I can't do, I don't have that. I'm a choir oh, kid. Oh, oh, that's it, that's it, that's it. I love that one. So it's a, that song is just a phenomenal. And can you share that story behind that with my audience? Absolutely, yes. Well, you know, I co-wrote this song with Preston Glass and um, when I was in LA and it's, you know, we, I wanted to have a song that really had an international flair to it. Um, and, and which is why I've incorporated all these different languages. And the, the song itself is about, it's literally about when I mentioned to you, like after I graduated from college, I started traveling around. I was singing, you know, with Vienna Kama Opera. I was singing um, with Opera Stockton in Italy. I was singing, I was doing recitals um, right outside of Munich, Germany. Um, I mean, I was just, it was just great. I was traveling all over. And so this song is very, um, very biographical in a way when it comes to the, from the, the traveling essence of it. And that is why I have like, you know, yeah, ich liebe das Leiden. And, you know, que sera se la vie mon ami. You know, I, I was throwing in all these different, you know, some Spanish, some, some, um, uh, some Romanian, some French, some uh, German, and just to kind of give it that world music flair because it really was um, biographical of my experience, you know? Um, and I think a, with a lot of songwriting, you know, many songwriters write about the things that they've experienced. And so this specific song was basically based on me traveling like through Germany and and Spain and, and Italy and, and having, having these experiences with uh, suitors and people trying to charm me, you know, cause I was this American girl and, you know, new to the country and performing on stage and, and really kind of uh, realizing that, you know, despite all the suitors that I was being approached with that, I found the one and only, which is my husband, uh, Simeon. He's Romanian. And there is this line in in uh, Romanian, tu a centro vieci mele simi. And it's just saying like how much I love him and that he's he's the one and only for me. And so that's the last, that's the last um, um, foreign line that I have in this song because it all talks about the Germany and, and the French and, and, and Spanish. So it's, and then the goosebump moment, that title is inspired by Oprah Winfrey. You know, um, Oprah used to always say, I have to say Oprah, like she's my friend. I mean, Miss Winfrey. <laughs> um, but we all say Oprah because, you know, that is her branding, you know, the Oprah magazine and, you know, <laughs> but. The Oprah um, that. You know, so like no disrespect by saying Oprah, you know, <laughs> but it's just that's who she is. And she used to always say, oh, that gave me a goosebump moment when I mean, she had her television show and all these different things that would give her a goosebump moment. And so that is the title. The title of the show is inspired by her always saying that and me watching her TV shows all the time and and realizing that all these different experiences that I had when you really hit that chemistry with that person that you love that one and only 
you get that goosebump moment. So that goosebump moment is the moment that I met my husband at that time, you know, the, uh, my boyfriend, but you know, um, that goosebump moment is that moment where you're like, Ooh, okay, this one's different than the others. And so that goosebump moment is inspired by Oprah, but also inspired by that, that immediate reaction when you meet someone really special and you know that this is, this is different than the others. Awesome. Awesome. We got to start laying down a conversation. So where is the best place that my audience can connect with you on social media? Absolutely. Um, I am on Instagram. I'm Diva Nikenji. So D-I-V-A and then N-K-E-N-G-E on all the social platforms. I try and keep it consistent. So it's Diva Nikenji it, on Twitter. On I have Nikenji's music on Facebook for those who want to do Facebook. Diva Nikenji on TikTok, Diva Nikenji in Instagram, nikenjimusic.com is my website. And um, there is also, a, I have a link tree that's connected to my Instagram page that they can sign up and receive newsletters. So I send out newsletters twice a month as for people to know where I'm performing, if I'm going to be doing any TV experiences, then they can, no matter where they are, they can kind of tune in or live stream concerts and things like that. So always sign up at nikenjimusic.com or on my link tree through Instagram. And I or send me a DM. I always respond to DMs and, and always love to meet and greet new people that are enjoying my music and my music goosebump moment is on all platforms itunes spotify everywhere everywhere amazon so you know listen to the tune and write a review and uh check it out awesome so guys if you missed an episode of the jake's take with jacob lhr podcast visit our channels on amazon music Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Podchaser, Spotify, and Spreaker. It's Jake's Take with Jacob Elishar, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. Now, are you on social media? I'm on social media, too. Facebook, Instagram, Threads, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. Jacob Elishar, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. And guys, you want to hear my take on Goosebump Moment and what found out what's going on with Mass Singer this season, who won America's Guys Talent Fantasy League, this is the blog that started all, chicks.chick.com. Once again, chicks.chick.com. The Kenji, it was an honor and privilege to welcome you. And thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to speak with me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it too. All righty, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, have a great one, everybody. Goodbye.